Hello, I am Anne Collins Smith, the curator of collections at the Spelman College Museum of Fine Art. I am delighted to be in community with you this evening. Thank you to the Contemporary Arts Center New Orleans for the invitation to participate in tonight's panel, Behind, Healness and, Behind Healing and Wholeness, Art and Health. As part of the exhibition, Behind Every Beautiful Thing, Encountering Bodies, Wrestling the Human Condition. The exhibition Behind Every Beautiful Thing features multimedia works from 36 Gulf South artists, and it offers a deeply personal portrayal of artists' experiences with health and illness and the reverberating impact on the life, body, and psyche of the individual and their community. This exhibition was curated by Dr. David Robinson Morris. Art has long intertwined with health and wellness. In New Orleans, we live amongst art. Art is in our everyday. Art is often our prompt sucker. As we grapple with the resurgences during the pandemic, confront the myriad health disparities, and now the impact of Hurricane Ida, we are gathered together to discuss the power of art to bring healing, shed light on the myriad health disparities um, hindering equitable health outcomes, and articulate what lies beneath and behind our collective inability in this moment to heal whole. Joining us this evening are Dr. Daniel Berge Shande, artist Anne Haley, whose work is featured in Behind Every Beautiful Thing, and Dr. Cerisi West Olatunje. Please, panelists, say something wonderful about yourselves. The panelists' bios are in the links that were shared and also on the Contemporary Arts Center's website. Sure, I'll start. Um, something wonderful about me. Uh, I I have a lovely son, a five-year-old son. Hi, I'm Anne Haley. Um, something wonderful about me. Um, gosh, I I'm a teacher. Um, I work with uh, middle school cis boys right now, um, and I teach them art every week, and that's powerful for me. Thank you. Something wonderful about me. Uh, well, I want to be really present. We have, are still in recovery since Hurricane Ida. And so I'm just glad to be back home and uh, in recovery. So it was a beautiful day today. I'm feeling very grateful for that. It was absolutely gorgeous here. Thank you. I am the irony of um, the photograph that I'm ensconced in, the name of this exhibition was presence. And it speaks to soft power and being present. And I am grateful to be present in New Orleans during the time of this pandemic so that I could help navigate because I'm a, I'm a daughter of a woman dad now to help my dad navigate the recovery. So thank you everyone for joining us tonight. So a bit of a biographical question but through inspiration, who or what brought you to your practice, your professional practice, your avocation? Dr. West Olatunje? My mom was a counselor, so um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm biased. <laughs> You know the drill, absolutely, to be present. So I would say um, I've always had a calling, right, to be a healer in, in that sense, actually. Um, and so it's taken a while for me to blend those things, what I would call the organic healing 
and then you know being plunged into a, a very different kind of world where I acquire my skills and then having them to blend again so that I could be useful and recognizable to people in the community, in the world, and so on. And I've been fortunate that that was able to happen. So uh, I think I've always, always, I mean, just thinking in terms of uh, some of the spiritual aspects of that, of being very, very young and having vision, seeing people who were no longer alive, mm -hmm. who were sending messages and so on, um, and really being receptive to that. And then, as I said, connecting that to more of the science uh, of being uh, a therapist and then bringing those things back together again has been wonderful. So I'd say, I'm not sure if it's a person, uh, but just recognizing that this is who I am. It's who I've been. Thank you. Doppelganger, Anne? Um, well, I guess, I mean, I've, I've made art since forever. Um, I think more so for me, it was something that changed my art practice. Um, when I just moved to New Orleans in 2015, I got in like a major car accident with an 18 wheeler um, and had a chronic neck injury. Um, and that process of healing, also especially healing in New Orleans, which is a place that is constantly healing, um, felt just very moving for me. And um, I mean, my, my previous work did actually involve bodies and movement um but it was it wasn't until that accident and having to process all of that that I had to confront my own body and my own ability to move um so I guess I would not be where I am in my art practice now without that major incident um and I think a lot of it too was not just like the creation of it but the communication through that creation and the conversations that it started with other people in my community. Dan? Sure. Uh, so I'm a physicist by training and, um, you know, spending all my days in dark basements made me want something with a little more human connection. And so I decided to study something called medical physics which is, uh, among other things, building new types of medical devices to image the body. Uh, in doing that, I found that I was really interested in getting into patient care. And then that's what took me to medical school. And then I found a calling in radiology. <laughs> so I went back into dark basements, um, but this time for helping patients. And, you know, the whole time, uh, I've been black, right? <laughs> uh, and moving from this academic space, which has certain protections from some of the challenges of society to being much more present as a doctor, a clinician, mm -hmm. um, I started to kind of struggle with, you know, the work that I'm doing while meaningful to me is not in the service of equity, right? Um, there's a lot of work that needs to be done in the equity space and it's up to our generation as it was the generation before to try to do as much as we can to fix it so the next generation doesn't have to worry about it. Um, and that's what really brought me into this space of exploring how art can be used as a tool for health equity. And so now I work in the space of developing empathy and trying to use art as a tool to develop empathy and to create more inclusive spaces in healthcare. Thank you. How does one develop empathy? Can I take this one? please. Ah, okay, cool. Um, so it, it's really interesting. Uh, 
I usually I like to explain things with analogies. So empathy is being able to see yourself in another person. Now, there's a field of science called neuroaesthetics, and neuroaesthetics is how our brains interpret art and how that invokes emotions. And in the study of neuroaesthetics, some work has been done that shows that in our brain, we have these types of neurons, nerve cells called mirror neurons. These are the nerve cells that help us do this monkey see, monkey do activity, right? Um, it's also been shown that those are the circuits and pathways involved in an empathetic response, which is like, that's step one, right? Our brains have wires and pathways built for empathy. Now, the second thing is art, viewing art, experiencing art, watching theater, watching movies, reading books can actually drive those same circuits. Mm -hmm. So you can drive empathy. You can exercise your empathetic response like you'd exercise a muscle. And in that way, you can build empathy. And one of the interesting things about the role of art in the space of empathy is think about um, think about a movie that you like, uh, any romantic comedy, right? Well, it's easy stuff, romantic comedy. Harry Met Sally, right? There's always some interaction between the two lovers and it's all because they're confused, right? There's some miscommunication um, and one gets mad at the other and then they have a big fight and they go away. But then that one of them learns that the other one or one of them learns they were mistaken and they get back together and everyone's happy in the end, right? Now think about that climax, that big fight. Mm -hmm. You as the viewer know this thing that the characters don't know. You know who's in the right, who's in the wrong. You know that maybe he said, he was going to go on a date with her for a bet, but ever since then, he's fallen in love with her, right? And so you, you know all this, and that informs your response. Now consider uh, you're walking down Bourbon Street. I don't know much in New Orleans, so I just know Bourbon Street, right? You're walking down Bourbon Street, and there's a couple having an argument, mm -hmm. right? There's no backstory in this case. You don't know what that backstory is. So then you provide your own emotional context, and you decide who's right and who's wrong, right? And that might not match up with reality. But the important thing is, in the movie example, right, you have all of that backstory to inform your understanding of the experience. And that's what art allows you to do. The artist creates the backstory. They create the composition. They put the characters where they put them or they write all the story up to that point. The actors play the story up to that point. And in that way, they tell you how you're supposed to feel. And okay. they kind of can guide you through there. And that's what we can do with art as a tool for empathy. We can shine that light, that focus on a specific empathetic pathway or a specific topic. Thank you. I was going to ask you to use the example of Queen and Slim. <laughs> you know, when Harry met Sally, and that's my generation, I was just like, so how does this operate later? But, and as an artist, artist, who's an artist in this exhibition, how do you feel about what Dan said? How do you feel about his statement about how the artist creates the context? How would you um, respond to that? Um, yeah, I think that, um, and I mean, I think in thinking about the process, the evolution of my work, I feel like when I first started making art, there, there was context, but it was more explorative and like inspired by others and, you know, all of these things, um, that we're doing when we're in school, that we're just figuring it out and figuring out what processes we like, um, but I feel like, and that, that still is art and counts as art, but I think when art really, when you really make it count with art, you have that context and you share that context. Um, I think I used to be kind of into the sort of 
vague abstraction where I had context behind it, but nobody needed to know about it. Um, and because of that, I wasn't relating to people or starting conversation. I agree with what uh, Dan said that you have to give people that context and um, talk to them about your process, especially in my form of work, because it is very abstract. Um, it's not always obvious. So I, I have to be able to like write about it and communicate about it and explain how the process relates to the context. Um, and I think that's what makes great work versus just hotel art. <laughs> Thank you. Dr. West Olatunje, you mentioned very early that whatever you do or your practice as a, a scholar and an advocate, it has to be useful and recognizable. Can you tell us more about that, please, and how that is deployed in your professional practice? Yeah, so it's important to, to see art as a reflection of what's happening mm -hmm. in the moment in society. So it captures that. It, uh, ca it can capture fractals where you have just a brief moment and be so, um, just so crisp in the way in, it, in which it reflects how people are feeling, whether it's positive or whether it's negative. But I, I think when I, I listen to Anne uh, as she talks about her evolution is I, I hear the word courage. So it takes a while to become emotionally mature to be able to articulate what it is that we're feeling and capture what we are feeling, that we, that sense of community that reflects where we are uh, in a moment, in a moment in time, uh, in a moment in society, in a moment in an era. And so it's important for us to see that art is not uh, separate, it's not devoid from the experiences that we're having as a people, uh, whoever that people are, it's not separate from that. So it's important to understand that there's, there is a group, there's a communal experience in art. And I think that's what gives it the power uh, because it provides this transparency of feelings uh, that people can recognize. So I can walk through the exhibit and take a look at Anne's work and feel something. And it's because I'm tapping into my own experiences about that and I'm connecting with the artist who is expressing what I'm feeling. Uh, and I think that that's the beauty of art. That's the true beauty of art is that it can speak to and articulate the feelings of someone you don't even know uh, and do it so well that the person uh, feels it with within their body. So um, that that's what I mean about it being a reflection uh, of and recognizable to a community uh, that to me, that that's wonderful art, whether it's very raw, uh, someone who's just starting out, or it's someone who's very accomplished and they're able to do that. But I think that most people walking through an exhibit regardless of where someone is developmentally, if they can feel that, um, they, they believe that, that that's good art. Thank you. Dan, would you share more about the people's heart, please? Emphasis on the art. Yeah. Um, so first of all, I guess I have to say I... I mean, to say I'm a socialist, is, who knows what that means, but um, I believe that hospitals and large corporations have an obligation to improve the lives of the people in the communities that they exist in, mm -hmm. right? So that's, that's the core of this. If you are some company or some organization in a space, it is your duty to improve the lives of those people and not necessarily move other people in mm -hmm. to say that they're of higher status of some way, but to, you know, to help the population that is currently there or was there before. Um, and what we would do at 
the hospital I'm at or many hospitals in the United States is we'll have our large academic medical center and then we'll put little uh, outpatient centers in the communities, right? Where pa patients can come and get their MRIs or their x-rays or they can see their primary care doctor. And it's very common to put these in those office parks, right? And they have no connection to the community. They don't engage in the local economy. They don't help the local groups. And, you know, this is multiplied X fold in underserved populations. So our people of color, our LGBTQ individuals, our uh, patients with limited English proficiency, right? We are not good about supporting these communities the other 364 days of the year. We're only there for them when they come to us, give us money to make them less sick. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as, as we're kind of in this time of uh, social justice and coming to grips with, you know, what it means to be an equitable society, um, one strong push that I had was we need to become engaged in communities. And one way to really do that is to not just support the health aspect, but all the other aspects of community. And a large part of that is the arts that a community develops for themselves, because that's the voice of that community. And so what we do is we work with local artists, artists from across the world. And what we try to do is curate installations to very specific topics of health equity. So we, we would have like an installation, we, we just wrapped an installation on um, individuals experiencing homelessness. It was called Off the Grid. Mm. And it was actually, all of these individuals were taught by uh, professional photographers, the, the art of fine art photography. And then they were allowed to go out into the world. They were all given high expensive digital cameras and they were told, you know, just take pictures of things that you find beautiful. And they met with the photographers every week for six months. And they used the opportunity to learn about, learn skills of photography, but also to use that as a way to uh, discuss and have like a group therapy sessions around issues of homelessness. And so then from that, and they were able to collect like 6,000 images, and they just have this amazing collection, this amazing body of work. And what we did was we took about 20 of those images, along with quotes from the individuals in the project, and we put them on the wall in our hospital. And I mean, these things were really nice. And so as people were walking by, like the main drag of our hospital, they would see this art and they'd stop and they'd look at it and appreciate it as one does with art. And then they would look and they would see the story, like, by the way, all of these pieces of art that you just felt were beautiful were created by individuals experiencing homelessness. And then what that does is it allows you to then have that context after you've made that connection. And you say, wow, you know, that person is capable of creating something beautiful that, you know, I, I would try to create, or maybe I even, I couldn't, I couldn't even create. And what that does is it manages to rehumanize them. In healthcare, we have this issue where uh, we see individuals experiencing homelessness as a burden because they're always coming to our emergency rooms, not from any fault of their own, but because we don't have systems set up that actually are capable of helping them long-term and having longitudinal uh, care for them. So they're forced to become super users of our system. And the more we use, the more we see them in the inpatient and in the emergency setting, the more we begin to think like, is it that person's fault, right? Are they coming in because, you know, it's they're a bad person. And being able to see such beauty come from these individuals 
just causes our healthcare staff to kind of refresh. And then they store that image in the back of their lizard brain. And then the next time they're caring for an individual experiencing homelessness, hopefully, you know, that comes up front again and it changes the way that they engage in that interaction. Thank you. How else are the artists impacted by that project? How else, uh, how are different artists impacted by the project or these same artists? The specific, um, the, the specific project. Oh, this was, oh man, this was a really interesting project, I have to say. Um, so it was created by a, a doctor who was also interested in photography and then a number of other photographers. And, you know, she didn't create, help co-create this thing because she was a doctor, it just she was a volunteer at this uh, emergency shelter and they wanted to open up the shelter all day instead of just having night service. So they wanted to raise some money and they said, oh, well, we could do this photo thing to raise money. Um, and the cool thing was they called it off the grid because typically individuals experiencing homelessness are just kind of like we see them separate from our world. Right. They, they don't have addresses. They can't, you know, become meaningful parts of the economy. They're just kind of like somehow ghosts moving through space. And what they did here was the project. The goal of the project was to get people back on the grid. Mm -hmm. So in teaching them the skills of photography, they were able to actually get them opportunities to work city events uh, as photographers start to build up, you know, an income, some sort of like uh, following. And a number of these individuals were able to uh, become domiciled. And then furthermore, a lot of them found their voice as advocates for individual, other individuals experiencing homelessness. Thank you. Yeah. I would love to return to impact and a charge for us near the end of the panel. But I'd like to pull the scab off of something. What makes us enable to be whole, to heal whole temporarily? What's that challenge? What what what's the what's what's the chasm? What's the levy, you know, besides the kind of the obvious? Well, I'll, I'll add. So um, I think that it's important for us to embrace ourselves in every which way that sounds like um, it's, hugging ourselves in real time, physically. It's also doing that emotionally. Um, I think that, you know, certainly our society contributes to this issue of not being good enough. Our society uh, tends to focus on the beautiful. If you take a look at, you know, what the media is and what it looks like and so on. And so that becomes a measure for people of what they should look like. Instead of us really getting our cues from other spaces and those spaces that will tell us that we're good enough. I mean, everybody's a work in progress, that's true. But I think that we should all start every day with the mantra of I'm good enough uh, to understand that uh, there is satisfaction. We need to be able to become self-aware, self-satisfied, right? Um, to be able to go through the various levels of healing and transformation that are needed in order to live abundantly in life. A lot of people concentrate on happiness. We tend to talk about being happy, wanting to be happy, not happy. Uh, you know, sad, depressed, and so on. Um, but I say that we need to really focus on things that are much more meaningful and really just starting with this idea that I'm good enough just as I am. Um, and that's accepting our, you know, frailties, 
It's accepting our weaknesses. It's accepting our faults. Um, and it uh, does also mean that we're good at making choices about uh, who are the people uh, that we surround ourselves with. Are they people who also embrace this idea that we're good enough? Because it means that they're gonna be very forgiving about the kinds of experiences that we have uh, in growing. So that's life. Life is messy. Uh, life is filled with uh, failures and successes. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's filled with uh, a lot of disappointments. It's filled with surprises. It's filled with all kinds of wonderful and delightful things. Um, but our ability to cope is really based on our ability to withstand all of those things mm -hmm. and to transform. So, you know, maybe I wasn't that person yesterday, but I am that person today. And the question is, how did I get here uh, to be able to do that? Um, and you can hear it. You can hear it uh, when people are talking about who they are and how they got here. Uh, you can see it uh, in the beauty of who they are how they walk, what their facial expressions are. Uh, you can experience that. You can see it in their work, whether it's visual art, performance art, whether it's teaching, uh, whatever it is, you can see it in the way in which people are in the world. So I, I think that's important. When I think about uh, what Dan said earlier, I was gonna bring up neuroesthetics, so I'm glad that you did, uh, thinking about that, about, um, how do we develop compassion, right? So the question is, you know, where do we intentionally place those prompters to be able to do that? Do we just let the world be as it is? Uh, or do we raise up our artists? Because that's typically what they do in a society. They keep us on the straight and narrow. So they will show us when we're not being compassionate. They will show us what it looks like. Um, they will also show us what it does look like when we're being compassionate. So do we intentionally surround ourselves with examples of how and why we need to be humanistic? We need to act like humans. So I always say to my students, as human beings, we only have one job and that is to persevere To And we do that through our interactions with other people. And that dictates everything. So if I feel good about myself and I look at you and you're a human, I'm, I should feel good about you and recognize that when you're not doing your best and fulfilling yourself, <clears throat> then you need those supports to be more fully human. And so I see artists as healers also in that sense because they can raise us up and show us where we need to be, what we could do better. Um, and, and that I think is their value in society. I think they are the core of society. They allow us to do that. Um, people like me, we come in and we explain why that works, but you know, they're going to bring that and present that and allow people to feel something um, and to reflect. So self-awareness, is important uh, to recognizing who we are, uh, the beauty of it, the ugly of it, uh, and then to embrace ourselves and say, I like all of me, not just part of it. I like all of me. Um, and those parts that are not as good, I'm gonna work on those. Um, and those parts that are good, I'm gonna share them with other people. Thank you. There is a question that is very similar to the one I was going to ask Anne Haley. And the question reads, so as the artist in the room, how do you think about the academic and our medical concepts of empathy? And how do they square with what you want your art to be received by, how you want your art to be received by others? Um, that's a great question. Um, I mean, especially my experiences with receiving or not receiving empathy from the medical field. Um, 
and and maybe there I can kind of tie in the question that you just asked uh, in with this too. Um, I think that this idea of wholeness, um, I had to go through my own journey of understanding my own internalized ableism um, in thinking about wholeness. Um, I felt like when I had my accident, I was broken and that to be whole, to be fixed was going to be this like linear journey from broken to whole. Um, and the thing, the truth though, is that like, we are all born whole. Um, and you know, it's not, even if, even if we are not born able-bodied, we are still whole. Um, and even if we are born able-bodied and something happens and that changes, um, we are still whole. Um, it's, I think that healing is different than being fixed. And I think going into my healing process, um, I was expecting doctors to fix me. Mm -hmm. um, and I wasn't thinking about how I could heal me. Um, I was really just waiting for them to do the thing to fix me and make me better. Um, and many doctors, you know, like doctors save lives, doctors are great. And they're also human harm and can have a lack of empathy and, um, often understanding of a lack of understanding of actually what their patients might be going through. Uh, they haven't necessarily had the surgeries that they are doing. Um, and so they're kind of lackluster in the ways that they communicate how that can affect you for the rest of your life. Um, and, you know, the sort of vague, like, well, yeah, we're going to do this thing and it's going to make your neck better, but like, you, you'll probably still be in pain the rest of your life. But like, you know, and now at least the bones won't be moving around. Um, and so I guess I, I had to come to terms with understanding that like, I'm never going to be fixed, um, but I can heal. Um, and that the wholeness was always there. I just had to love myself differently and carry myself through that to answer both of those questions in one. Um, I think I had to learn that doctors are, are tools. <laughs> They're tools to help me, you know, get through this process. Uh, <laughs> but it's really me. It was my body that healed itself. My body did all of this work. Um, also thinking about wholeness, like, yeah, as a society, we are maybe not whole. Maybe we are broken as a society, but as individuals, we are all whole. Maybe we're not all healed. Um, and maybe that's where society gets broken um, when people running it are not healed. Um, but I think that if we all individually work on our healing, um, there's no way that it would not like impact our society uh, to be whole. <laughs> so, Anne, yeah. you probably yeah. teach or interact um, with. Uh, yeah. Okay. So, you teach and interact maybe with a younger audience. How do you impart that upon your students? Um, In this world that's full of, you know, um, video gaming and social media, which counteracts sometimes our personhood and humanity. So how do you impart that? Yeah, um, that's an interesting question. My students are, I mean, I've taught all over New Orleans, charter school, private school, uh, free art studios, um, all of that. But the school that I'm at currently and that I've been at for the last five years is um, a boys home and the students live there um, and if they have home to go to on the weekends they do um, not always um, and so they 
and they're all it's all a case by case basis they're all coming from different backgrounds but a common theme is that there ha have been struggles in their lives and lack of support oftentimes um and so with this particular group of students i it's not the same as when i was teaching like the bratty private school kids who would like abuse my supplies and not understand the importance of like this one black marker the, the only one left because we've run out of all of them that didn't mean anything to them um but like the students that i'm teaching now uh you know it's a they approach art differently they're a little bit more grateful and um i feel like my main goal with them um because they are middle schoolers so this is like as they know it the worst time of their life um and the first times that they're feeling insecure um and they all think that they're terrible artists and like they all think they can't draw they all you know get down on themselves and like ultimately my goal is to just prove to them that like they are artists and they can do these things and they can do them in whatever ways they want to approach them. Um, and there is generally like in the curriculum that and I get to create my own curriculum and it's often sort of felt out based on, you know, what students already know and what they don't and often just like figuring out what they're going through and what kinds of lessons would be beneficial to their healing. Um, so we do a lot of like, you know, self portraits where we talk about things that we want to leave in our past and things that we want to see in our future and, um, you know, different, like making their own shields that like, what are the things that protect them? What are the things that are going to keep them safe? Um, so I guess I, you know, it's not always like so verbatim that I talk to them about healing and that. I mean, we, we do talk about uh, like social justice and things like that, but I, I think it's often, I, I try to let them get there on their own um, and sort of just listen to what they're concerned about because they have concerns um, and sort of trying to problem solve with them that like what are ways that we can make art to impact the world um and similarly like at another school uh in 2020 i did a mural project with some students middle school students this was a different school but um they they chose to do a mural that was for social justice and they chose a quote um and like created this planet that had all of these different characters that they had all created that all looked different, that were all inspired by their own selves really. Um, and all of the characters had flags and the flags had something that was important to them that they thought should be a main focus on this planet. And so um, we saw everything from and they chose all of this, um, choosing like, um, let's see, there were flags about clean water for all people and Black Lives Matter and LGBTQ rights, women's rights, um, education, access to education um, and other various things. But that, uh, like I said, I think a lot of that was just letting them speak to what they thought was important and me just kind of giving them the tools to be able to do that. So, okay. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So the other question is, how do the conceptual academic versus the experiential and personal aspects of art and its creation fit together? That's for Dan and Cerisi. So, uh, you know, first I would say that this academic cons this academic framework is really just a framework for looking at 
the concept of empathy and looking at the concept of design. Kind of like um, if you're a wine drinker, uh, some people drink wines and they'll talk about the tannins and the notes and uh, all that silly thing. I mean, I don't drink wine, right? But they'll talk about all these things. And then some people drink wine because it's just like, yeah, it tastes good, right? <laughs> and they're both equally meaningful ways of discussing something that inherently we or a group of people just enjoy, right? Building empathy, concepts of art affecting behavior, these are um, just inherent things that exist. And as we try to kind of get a better understanding of why they exist and how they work, we have to, one way in which we do that is by putting them to these academic frameworks. But that doesn't necessarily mean that we're subtracting from this deeper, more personal experience. And I'd say, you know, this overarching thing that I do is actually called experiential design. And this is something that comes out of behavioral psychology, um, which is the idea that we as individuals engage with each other, engage with systems, and these systems can change themselves in certain ways. So they can either better or less well serve us or serve whoever their customer, end user, patient, whatever you want to call that is. You can think about a good example of experiential design uh, gone awry is whenever you're at the airport and you're sitting in those chairs, like right before you're going to get on the flight, you can never lay down, right? There's always like this thing where there's an armrest where if that armrest wasn't there, you could lay down, but because it's there, you can't. That is a type of architecture called hostile architecture, right? It's preventing you from doing something. Uh, what I hope to accomplish with my career or just always push for is whatever the exact opposite of hostile architecture is, right? I want to help other people build more inclusive spaces more welcoming spaces, more warming spaces. And I have to say, um, listening to Anne and how you, you help your, the children that you work with, um, it sounds identical to the artistic director I work with for the People's Heart. Um, she's an art therapist. And you know, she, she, she would tell me that uh, she could walk into a room with a shoe and she could just call herself a shoe therapist because sometimes it's less about the thing that you were getting the person to engage with, but the fact that you're engaging with them and helping them on a way of self-discovery. And you know that's to a degree what art is when we're young in school. It's a way to self-discover. And as we're older, as we grow up and we kind of come into the world, it's the world around us that help us rediscover new things or change our perceptions of things. And art, again, is just a way where someone can engage with us across time and space and kind of help us in that direction of, you know, bending that moral arc of justice in the right direction. Superbly stated. Dr. Wessel and Toon, please. Yeah, I'll add to that. So I, I think the, the work that what I've come to believe in my career is that the idea of those things being separate is very much a part of our paradigm in this society. But there are other places, there are other societies where they're not. Uh, I remember back in the late 1990s, I was in uh, Japan and working with uh, educators there. And there, scholars are not even considered reputable or credible if they don't partner with practitioners to engage in the research. And that's because 
we need the folks on the ground with the pulse to who are really experiencing it uh, to be able to help us to have more truthful research uh, in, in which we engage. And that's on a lot of different levels. I mean, think politically, we think about folks who are marginalized, who are in the fringes, nobody cares about, uh, that their voices are not at the table, their viewpoints, their perspectives, uh, their lived experiences are not integrated into what knowledge is. So when we construct knowledge and we leave out a whole bunch of people, how credible is it? How truthful is our research? How stable? is that knowledge. And so it's important that those things are not separated, that they're brought together. I remember when I took a bunch of people for an outreach trip to Haiti after the earthquake. And I decided uh, to bring an artist with me because I said, there's no way that we can even tap into how it feels to be in that environment without an artist interpreting for us and serving as a bridge uh, to them in a million ways. Uh, and I was right, when we got there, you know, we're all behavioral scientists, we're therapists, we're this, we're supervisors. They didn't care about us. It was the artist that they wanted to talk to. It was the artist who they had credibility uh, in there. And it was the artist who gave us entree into the communities. Uh, it, it was so fantastic, and I can't even begin to tell you not only their interactions with the artists, but also having the artists interpret, which was a, a nice change because usually I'm brought in to so many spaces to interpret what's going on. It was so fantastic to have an artist who is explaining what we're looking at, whether it was people walking around and so on. Uh, or it was even seeing some of the art on the side of the road. I didn't know what I was looking like. It was like the wine with Dan. It's like, you know, I'm just looking at it. It's just, that's pretty. I want that. That's pretty, you know. But he would just go into this whole thing explaining all the details of why this particular piece was important and so on. And in that way, he was interpreting our world for us to be able to understand that. So it, it's so important to be able to bring those things together. So over time, I realized I don't care if I get my grant from NIH, NSF, or wherever I get the grant, I always make sure that I have practitioners of some sort who are engaged in the work with me so that I can stay close to truth uh, and not insert my own truth about what's going on. So for me, I, I've, I've fused the two, uh, and I see those two as really important uh, to be able to do that. Uh, but that takes a lot of honesty. Uh, you know, in, certainly in academia, uh, there is just this thing where we smell, you know, ourselves in that sense that we think we know everything, um, when in some cases, we know very little. So we need to understand that it's, we're really, uh, I wouldn't even say two sides of the same coin. We're on the side, same side of the coin. We just need to understand that it, it is a, a, a complex picture. Thank you. We all are in the work of care. So this is a question about self-care. What and this is the question before we will open it up into the audience. What is the beautiful thing for you right now? Dan, your mic is on, so you're first. <laughs> <laughs> um, I put this on because I, I wanted to build off what she oh, was okay. saying, you know, but I'll, I'll try to answer both. Um, man. <laughs> <laughs> it was just so like perfectly put, you know, I got to say, um, I really want our health institutions to have artists and residents like artists working up with the president, the executive suite, kind of helping them understand, especially now where we're talking about diversity, equity and inclusion, 
right? I want artists of color in those spaces. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I want LGBTQ artists. I want artists with disabilities. I want all of these people to kind of be active in our spaces and I want our spaces to accept them because like she was saying, we're actually really bad at a lot of things, at a lot of human things, because think about the people who run these spaces, right? We're so focused on getting through massive amounts of school and gaining massive amounts of success in business or academia that we don't have strong muscles in terms of our ability to connect. And we need to remember that we can't do everything, right? Of course, we think we can, but a lot of things we're really bad at. Um, and so, you know, the thing that is beautiful to me is experiences like this, because it, it reminds me that the work I do is actually meaningful and worthwhile. Like I, I did, I, you know, I apply for these grants like all the time, always hustling, trying to make that money for my research. And I just didn't get a grant. I found out this morning I didn't get a grant because I like to say because the people who were reviewing it didn't understand the, uh, the importance of the work I do, but who knows what it was. But you have those moments where you're just like, is it worth it anymore? Should I just give up? But then seeing people like this who you know, how we all feel the same way and we all understand the power that's there. It's just really motivating. Thank you. And what's the beautiful thing for you right now? Um, I think I have two. <laughs> um, I, and they'll kind of overlap, but um, I think that so I, I guess I'm on like year six of my healing process. Um, and so much of that time I spent creating work privately. You know, I, I wasn't showing it. I didn't have the capacity to be in shows or anything like that. It was just a long drawn out process of creating a large series of work. Um, and I, you know, in, writing about my work and things like that. Um, Audre Lord, one of her quotes kind of kept coming up for me about pain being important, um, how we evade it, how we deal with it, how we succumb to it, how we transcend it. And I kept feeling like I had done all of the things but transcend it um, until I actually got it all in the gallery uh, this past January. And then again, this summer getting um, my piece in the show at the CAC. Um, and I just, the beautiful thing was that I was able to transcend that through connecting with other people about it and um, being able to like see others and myself and myself and others and like learn and or not learn about completely different experiences um and so i think that just my beautiful thing i think this you know past year even though it's been a very strange time um has been some sort of closure uh through that injury um i feel like i learned how to rather than erase or extract what was hurting me just to like learn to hold a space to creating spaces to hold that hurt um and figuring out how to wrestle it confront it love and care for myself through all of that and um so one of the pieces in that show was my neck brace um that i had stitched the word support into and it had you know, like studs and spikes and butterflies um, all over it. And it was kind of floating in the gallery. Um, and I mean, in some ways it was kind of a, you know, an homage to the neck brace that held me up, that supported me through that. But I think what it represents to me now 
is um, the support that I just like have received from the people who love me, um, the my body, um, myself, um, and just like. I don't know. My body is like amazingly capable of so much and I don't give it enough credit. Um, and I think sometimes I have needed the people who love me to remind me of these things. And so I just am very grateful for the support that I've had in all the ways that I've had it and the opportunity to connect with other people through my work. Thank you. Dr. Wes Solentunji. Uh, I was caught up in your narrative, Anne, so it, it, it felt like a reverie, so I, I'm feeling really good. Um, my beautiful thing uh, is has become walking on the lake, so we have a big lake here, and um, I walked last winter into the spring until it got too warm, so it's been too hot even early in the morning, even at daybreak, it's too hot to walk on the lake. And today was a nice cool day in the low 70s with low humidity. And I'm just hoping that it portends cooler weather so I can get back to the lake. And one of the things I told myself at the end of the spring was that I was gonna take a canvas and some paint and I was gonna sit and I was gonna do whatever I do. So um, I, I don't know what, what it'll be, it'll, if it'll be anything, but just the experience is gonna make me feel really good. I love walking on the lake right at sunrise. Um, it is just absolutely beautiful. I love the wind. I love all of the wildlife and everything that's out there. It is just a wonderful feeling and reminds me of my childhood when kids, you could just roam the neighborhood. There was undeveloped area. So you were always walking in weeds, trees. I mean, just, you know, you're just wandering around, picking up random things, looking at them and just learning about the world. So it reminds me of that time in my life. And that it's, it's a beautiful thing. Everything I see feels so just, beautiful just it's it's just so crystal clear it's such a beautiful image that only my eyes can see so I'm gonna try to capture that and see what happens so that's my beautiful thing thank you I asked a question about you know our inability to um do things whole and I like to relate that to a poem about circles that was shared to be by a dear friend and mentor, Joe Moore Stewart. The poem goes as this, and now my phone, okay. They drew a circle that shut me out, heretic, rebel, a thing to flout, all of us. But love and I had the wit to win. We drew a circle that took them in. And that's by Edwin Markham. Thank you for being a part of this circle. Um, it's been a fantastic experience. It's been healing from a particularly difficult day. And I'd like to invite everyone to experience the exhibition behind every beautiful thing, encountering bodies, wrestling the human condition that's on view at the Contemporary Art Center until Sunday, September 26th. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for your openness, your professionalism, your passion. And thank you for sharing about your journey. And it's been a wonderful evening. And you can read more about the panelists on the website or on the Contemporary Arts Center's um, webpage, but um, Facebook page. And I would just love to thank you again. You know, gratitude is helpful. You know, it helps with the healing. And I can't wait to interact with you more beyond this panel and just be a part of it and contribute in what way I can, because I've certainly, you know, participated in this feast. And I hope everyone has a wonderful evening and gratitude to Dr. David Morrison for, for curating this extraordinary exhibition. I'll see it a couple of times before I leave. 
So everyone have a wonderful evening and good night. Good night.